to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 77. I'm delighted today to be joined by Andreas Beck from Borussia Dortmund, the head of performance. Andreas, how are you? Yeah, fine so far. It's a bit yeah, of a crazy time. <laughs> it is a crazy time, you're right, at the moment. So what's the, what's the current situation over there with, with the players? Yeah, we're uh, back into training. Uh, to be honest, um, after a, a, a couple of weeks just of, of uh, home office and home training, like the, like you see uh, all over Instagram, um, we're back, uh, or gone back last week um, into team training where we just coupled players together with uh, two players just at one time with football and physical preparation and and split them uh, over the whole uh, day. So uh, yeah, this was this was uh, pretty busy <laughs> in terms of organization and, and, and long days for us. Um, yeah, but uh, we managed it very good. And yeah, next week we're gonna um, yeah, have some bigger groups, but also no contact, no tackling, uh, so no physical contact, uh, keep our uh, distances. And, um, obeying the, the, the hygienic uh, rules from the authorities. Yeah, it's a, it's a testing time, isn't it? It's a time when yeah. uh, we put in situations that we don't n normally get put in. We have to adapt to it. So it's, it's interesting to hear our different clubs in, in different areas are preparing at this time. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Do you want to, yeah. want to just take us back? Because obviously we've touched there on the current situation, but take us back through your career so far. I've, I've obviously mentioned your current role, head of performance at Borussia Dortmund. But do you want to take us back to where you've been in your career so far? Yes. Um, at least I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, after, after university or while being at the university, I, I, uh, my original career plan was uh, to go for a PhD and, and stay in, Training science, uh, training science research, but um, it got interrupted. Um, then, uh, when I got a call from, from uh, the club um, uh, FC Nuremberg, it was the first uh, league club. In, it was in uh, 2007. Um, I just graduated, and uh, yeah, I moved over uh, and uh, found my way into football. Then, after five years. Uh, at uh, Nuremberg, um, Borussia Dortmund came around and asked me to join them in a team. So um, after doing everything on my own at, at uh, Nuremberg and started to build everything from the ground up, in a way, um, yeah, I I changed to a bigger team. So we were three at this time with the head of uh, performance at this time, Andreas Dr. Andreas Schumer. He's well known in German Federation uh, and. Um, yeah, it's a capacity in, in rehab, um, and I learned a lot from him. And then uh, when he left, with uh, when Jurgen Klopp uh, resigned in Dortmund, um, Thomas Tuchel came with his own uh, physical performance. Went to Ryan and tried, so he took over all the, the um, uh, on-field work, and I uh, I had my place in in rehab, which which also chose my mind because I had there all my own responsibility and uh, could, could build a criteria-based uh, program for the club and stuff like this. Um, it was a really good time. I learned a lot. Um, I developed myself in, 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 in this role. But then um, when Thomas also left, um, yeah, they promoted me to be the head of performance and uh, we had to fill the gap in rehab with an, uh, uh, with our best academy rehab coach at this time. This was Anke Steffen, so the first woman in pro uh, football. Uh, but she left us, unfortunately, to Norwich uh, la uh, last year. So we filled that gap again. And uh, now here we are in a team of four uh, with a data analyst uh, flow. Uh, who is here since eight years, uh, who does all the on-field work uh, with me and Johannes Weaver, who does the rehab. So, oh, that's so awesome. Nice. And I, we're going we're gonna to dive into um, the rehab side of your preparation just shortly, because I know there's loads of stuff we can go into in, in that regards. 
Well, just to yeah. start with, you mentioned there about all the changes at the club and obviously the changes with the head coach. So what's your experience been with that? How has that affected your role when different coaches with different philosophies come into the club? Yeah, this is... Um, I have to think. I, I, I think I have nine coaches right now in, in 12 seasons, but just two clubs. And uh, yeah, every, every head coach has his own uh, philosophy and style of playing and therefore the, the physical demands for the players, for the positions, uh, for the preparation, uh, everything changes with that. So, um, but the, the underlying principles, how the, uh, is our philosophy uh, uh, regarding strength, regarding uh, prevention uh, exercise, regarding endurance capacity, uh, um, uh, how do we like to, to, to build our energy system development? This is this we try to back off and, and say, okay, this should be coach independent. So um, at least I, it doesn't matter which coach comes now to our club, the program can still run. It's, it's a uh, we'll touch on that later, I think, but it's a, it's, a, it's a robust philosophy. If that makes sense to you. <laughs> oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that robustness is something I want to go straight into because it, it's something that obviously we talk about a lot with players developing robustness and being able to, to get them to make it through a season, hopefully injury-free, but obviously injuries happen in football. So how do you guys approach building robustness with your players? Yeah, at least though, uh, through those programs. So we have some uh, fixed uh, yeah, content uh, on, in the week um, um, on, on when, we, when we go for, for example, in our microcycle to, to match day uh, uh, minus four. Um, there we there we uh, will do some some strength and uh, explosive stuff and uh, some some uh, of the injury prevention uh, lower leg in, in, in injury prevention which are a little bit hard so more that eccentrics uh, and and um, high isometrics uh, and then uh, this maybe we reduce in volume on uh, match day minus three. And then on uh, minus uh, three, we just go for upper body and core uh, uh, in strength endurance program, like uh, in a Tabata style, for example. Um, and then on minus one, um, more into explosive. Yeah, um, yeah to, to, to get that priming for an exact uh, prosthetic. Uh, Condensation effect and stuff like this. So this is this is how we would program a regular week, and from that we go on back. So uh, if we if we don't have a minus four, we still may have a minus three. If we don't have a minus three, we're gonna skip that, and then uh, we do the minus uh, two program. So um, this the the content is always depending on okay when is the next game, and this for all the different groups of players, the starters, the, the bench players and the reserves. So, um, yeah, we, we don't have that team session, but more individual groups within the week because my, in demanding schedule, some are at minus three, but some are at minus seven. Or those guys who may play with the, train with us, but play with the academy are uh, on a different schedule than in uh, terms of physical preparation. It's a challenge we face, isn't it, in terms of managing the individual within the team environment and making sure that everyone is available, really, that, but taking into account everyone's different schedules. And we'll go into your busy schedule um, in a little bit because I know over there in terms of the volume of games and Champions League games and there's a lot going on, isn't there? A lot, think, a lot of things to manage, but... I think that sort of defines what you were talking about in terms of the head coach. There's, there's principles that stay embedded into the program. Is that right? What you mean? Um, so in terms of 
the um, building robustness, those areas and those things that you're working on are not necessarily going to change depending on the game model because it's still the game. We've still got to prepare those players for that game. Yes, sure. There, there's some stuff we have to discuss with the with the coach when it comes to 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 the the, the on field stuff like uh, um, I don't know high intensity running, uh, and that we don't can. Do, this is just related to the gym based uh, prevention uh, and strength related stuff. Uh, the rest still is uh, on. Uh, we have to discuss with the with the coaches and to implement. Uh, uh, yeah try to do our best to find a way so everybody is happy with the, with the amount we're doing uh, and uh, um, everybody gets this content in. So um, with a, we have a very good relation to the assistant coaches uh, uh, where they can do forms with the ball. So, so we, we take, can discuss it before, okay, which groups or which players should do uh, should have a high amount of uh, high speed running or uh, who doesn't tick his 90% uh, of Emacs uh, uh, since a couple of days. So uh, we have that time three injury prevention box ticked. So um, yeah, they're very open and we're in a good communication, uh, but this is, this is uh, dependent also at the end on the coach, but because he is, uh, he makes the decision at the end. And that's good, right? because he's responsible for it. So. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? And they're, they're the ones that have that final say. Um, obviously, you're there to, to guide and assist, aren't you, when, when that's needed? But they do have the, the say at the end of the day on, on certain aspects. Um, I think it'd be great to go into a little bit more detail on that, on that uh, the strength program and the gym-based work that you guys are doing. Because you mentioned the eccentric work, the isometric work that the, the players are doing. So can you go into any more detail in terms of exercise selection and the sort of methodologies around that? Um, at the end, it's, it's more like we have an evidence-led approach where we say, okay, good, what, what seems to be after uh, the, the research, the best selection of exercises, uh, volume, intensity, and stuff like this. So. Um, when we go, for example, into hamstring pre uh, pre our hamstring prevention program, when we say okay, get hamstrings, adductors, uh, uh, calf, uh, muscle tears, this should this is the biggest amount of, of, of muscle injuries we, we should prevent, or we can reduce it. This uh, can be beneficial. Then, so we we uh, we try to choose exercises which seem to be beneficial, um, easy to learn, and, and easy to execute. Um, and in the terms of that, um, especially eccentric exercises, uh, induce a lot of uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, but when you're used to it, they don't. So it's, so um, we have to, to also choose exercises which we can do in every situation all across the whole season, in spite of demanding schedule, in a, in a, in a, on a regular basis. So, and this is this is the philosophy we ch uh, choose our exercise or we develop our exercise. So uh, we have, for example, for lower leg strength uh, or lower body strength, the trap bar deadlift. This is uh, a main exercise for us. Uh, it's the um, uh, Roman chair ISO hold in different variations uh, and uh, from the isometric side uh, and it's the Nordic hamstring for example. So this regards to, 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 to hamstring injury prevention off field. So. And then how, um, would that, how would that then relate on field as well because obviously we, we have both sides going on at the yeah. same time. So, so if you, I'm, I'm following uh, very passionate the research of JB Morin and uh, um, for example, who does a lot of these things, and, and he's working with uh, Andres Hagi from Uskal. Uh, he's uh, who, who's going to the detail uh, of how the, the the muscle is working in, in different situations. So 
is eccentric, still eccentric, or just at peak torque and stuff like this. So not diving into deep. At least you should uh, take out what helps. And but what sh what's uh, really uh, uh, helping is uh, the, the, to to be confident or to to expose the the, the, the body regularly to that uh, maxi uh, maximum velocity. And this is what we try to take at least two times per week to be at over 90%. I think that's not, that's, that's common sense in, in also in, the, in a lot of clubs in the Premier League and Bundesliga, but we, uh, we really like to, to, uh, that, to do that, to really try to take that regularly on match day minus three and within uh, the training on the day uh, after the, the technical warm-up. So our, our warm-up is, is, is all in all pretty long. So we, we start at, at, uh, with a regular warm-up, uh, just physical preparation. Um, and then there always comes a technical part with the ball with the assistant coaches. And after that, before they go into the big game, then uh, we expose them to, to a 90% VMAX on regular basis so this is this is our plan um at the end um, we had for example jonas to do here over here i don't know if you know him he's uh he's uh jonas has actually been he's been on the podcast before oh okay hi so, so i was gonna follow up yeah yeah he's a brilliant brilliant guy uh, um, i followed uh, i heard him on the podcast the first self then they brought him over for um, uh, intern um, uh, workshop and um, yeah, we, we adapted a lot of his uh, stuff. And uh, if, if you've done uh, uh, some scissors by yourself over uh, first over t t 20 meters, then over 30 meters, then uh, you'll feel your hem is really, really good on the next day. So uh, this is what we, where we try to sneak in some, some, uh, uh, some hemis work on field. If you, if, you, if you say, okay, good, we take the, the, the physical preparation also on the field. And one thing I spoke so to... Regards, regards to him. Yeah, <laughs> reward, yeah, definitely. The reward, the reward goes to Jonas in, in this case. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good to hear. Now, one thing that we, we spoke about in the episode with Jonas was the difference in identifying the, the sort of area that a player needs to work, whether it is... The, the sort of physical side, the output side, do they need to simply get stronger and produce more force? Or is it related a little bit more to the game in terms of learning positions, reading the game better, reacting reacting certain stimuli on the pitch? So how does that fit into your, your sort of preparation? Is, does that come into play or is that simply sort of dealt with it with the technical coaches because they're, they're working on that with the players and then this side is more the physical side? Yes, at least we're we're a little bit separated. In this case, we're not so far in in, in our program. I uh, I like the approach, also the um, uh, to to establish a force velocity profile. Um, I have that in mind since uh, a couple of years, and and, and JB came up with it. Um, but in reality, we didn't we didn't we, in the priority to do the basic stuff good. <laughs> At first, in the first place, uh, we're still uh, uh, at this point at the end. And this is maybe then uh, the, the, the next level we try and take. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. And uh, I said we were going to sort of touch on the schedule over there, Andreas, as well, because I know obviously it's a little bit different at the moment, but when we're into the season, normally we've got Champions League, we've got cup games, you've got the league games, you've got all the travel going on. How does that affect the sort of workload and what sort of considerations do you have to take into your approach with the players? Yeah, that's, that was really a problem. Um, we tried to solve it, at least with a model, the Q2 chronic workload model by Gavin. We have had him here last uh, month also, or this, no, last month. He was, he was here for, for a workshop, but... Um, uh, it was more to, to educate our academy staff just so they can work with the model too. Um, I know every model, if, if there's criticism, there's a lot of criticism out there, 
um, with it. Uh, but um, for us, it works because it helps. It helps us making us decisions and gives them some quick overview about the, the terms how um, um, how we we see the players. So we have for every every player uh, we have a playing profile. So out of the data from the game, there's a camera system based in every stadium in the Bundesliga and for um, Champions League games, uh, we, um, we uh, uh, let them track by our own. On our, uh, so we, 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 uh, we hire them, so they, uh, the, the company, so they track our uh, Check our games, so we have a closed loop, and and every game, and we can inject those data into our uh, our uh, uh, GPS system. Um, so we have a uh, um, good overview about the, the uh, chronic workload uh, the players are at at this moment, and out of the player profile and the demanding schedule, um, we can assume how much. Does he need? And um, therefore, we can top. We try to top him up. So, in uh, uh, with the starting uh, players and those who are rotating in and uh, have their, their game exposure, um, then we don't have any fitness problems. But those over a couple of weeks who don't play that much, those those uh, uh, reserve players, um, we have to top him up. And this is um, either when we when we have less than three games, um, uh, the less than three games uh, days to the next game, we will top it up uh, right after the game. Otherwise, on the next day. Because then that this obviously is. allows the squad to then be available, doesn't it? And for the for the coaching staff, that's obviously the. From their point of view, that's obviously a key role of yours, isn't it? For that availability. Yeah, the, the availability. The first thing is injury free, and the second team is uh, second point is ready. So um, if they have to substitute uh, uh, an, 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 an player after twenty minutes because um, he is physically not ready to play, then will they they will shout at us. But at the end, we are in a good communication and. Uh, talk before if the player is ready or not so and um, we're gonna follow this this concept and I'm sure we, we, we did, uh, it, uh, it developed over the time but um, we tried to educate the players very very soon as to why we're doing things and, and um, with covenant saying okay hey um, it, because you have to top up after the the training it's not because your, um, um, uh, you do train bad, like it was maybe uh, 30 years ago, but um, um, you're, you don't hit your physical error. If you don't do that here and right now, you're maybe not ready at the game because what you're doing is um, maybe for an offensive midfielder is, is pressing all the time. It's a very high uh, uh, physical demand. and. The trade, but the training load for that uh, center uh, center back was uh, sufficient. So, but for you in your position, uh, you need may need more today. So, and um, this this took a while. That this is uh, based on their individual players profile and their their strength. Um, and but uh, yeah, they. Sometimes it's hard <laughs> still <laughs> to convince them, but um, on, on a regular basis, they, they go for it and uh, do it because we just do it as much as they need. So, yeah. yeah, you're like, I think you're right. A few years ago, it would have been seen as like a punishment when they to do that extra running. But now I think players understand a little bit more that to play at these high levels, to be put into a Champions League game or a Bundesliga top of the table fixture you need to be ready don't you otherwise the bodies are going to break down i think in our role compliance is uh, is, uh, is the only way you can uh, make players do um efficiently what they need 
uh, if they if they do it because they think they were punished or threatened, then then the efficiency goes out of the window uh, because they don't feel it alive. They just yeah. They just uh, do do what they told to, but they're not happy with it. And this, with, with the compliance to to work hard, maybe also to suffer in in certain times, even if it's a bad situation for them. So, uh, just then, then they also, in my experience, um, even if if they don't play at this time a role for the team, that there's someone who's care with them and keep them up on it. So when the situation comes and they jump in, so they fit and they can show uh, the, that they're worth uh, to play and uh, have their value for the team. Um, this this uh, also yeah is an important factor then to 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 keep them fit. So education and compliance, I think, for of the players is is a very big thing in our role as a for, as a physical trainer. No, definitely. And I, I wanted to ask Andreas in terms of like your education, but the, the, your staff's education, I think you mentioned about having interns as well. So where, where do you do your sort of professional development now? Is it, is it getting people into the club like you mentioned about Jonas and, and Tim Gabbert? Um, where would you point people to sort of develop as practitioners? Um. I would say I, today um, I learn more from practitioners and how they organize things and how they do they apply certain ideas, uh, um, what comes out of the research in, in, in their context uh, and they're working in. Um, and from this, I, to be honest, I learned more than, than pure from, from research and, itself um, so I would advise anybody to to reach out to get experience so if you if you if you want to do good to to to, to work in team sport someday start to work in team sport even at a, a low I start with tennis players and, and hockey players at, at first while I was st still studying but uh, the experience you get, okay, how does a team work? How does it feel to be on field? How to speak in front of a group, of a group uh, is really important. Uh, more than the, how you apply the knowledge is more important than the knowledge itself, in my opinion. So um, uh, reach out, get your experience, and then, at, and then on, on top, try to always ask yourself how important is that what you want to teach and uh, in which priority would you find what's what's your top priority and go from there and if you don't f fulfill it then uh, uh, leave the rest on the side i'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here because i'm not prepared you for this one but i wanted to ask what who have been some of the biggest influences on your career whether that be people involved in the game or like it could be anyone, couldn't it? So, and I know there's obviously a lot, but if you could narrow it down to just a few, who would you say have, have been the most influential? For yeah, there, 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 there were um, there were a lot of. Um, it, it depends on the stage of the of, of the career where I was at the moment who had the most influence on me. So, at first it was uh, at the at the university. I, my first mentor was. Uh, Klaus Wirt, he was uh, at a training science department where I worked in, in, at the university um, from Dietmar Schmidtbleicher. Um, so he's uh, well known for strength uh, research in, in Germany and uh, also international in, in the times of uh, the 90s and 2000s around that. Um, and so he influenced me a lot of how to, how to, to to dive into to uh, uh, yeah science science research uh, uh, to do no compromises to, um, to read them to uh, analyze it and stuff like this and then later um, I when I uh, came to came to the world in the real world of, uh, of football and sports and context and 
then sure there was um, uh, Andreas Schlumberger, he, he worked uh, also at the rehab facility for uh, the physiotherapist of the German Federation. Um, had a lot of contact with uh, high level footballers, was an, is an expert in, 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 in movement, in movement application, uh, in, in thinking about in screening um, and uh, has a yeah has sensed me for for a lot of things how 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 I see movement uh, so which was then the next step and then um, I think Mike Boyle came around the corner so um, with uh, with a lot of great stuff a couple of years ago and then yeah, diving next to it then yeah some uh, the network starts, and then uh, 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 guys like like uh, Gabbett, uh, JB Mourin, uh, Jonas, um, Martin Boucher. Martin Boucher. Uh, I talked to him when we uh, faced Paris. Uh, this this was a great time. Laden Jovanovic can give a shout out. Yeah? Uh, uh, I took a lot of of him and how he sees uh, things into my own work. Um, yeah, those are those are my uh, my inf influential people right now. Yeah, and for then ResearchGate is <laughs> is definitely definitely the main thing to go to. Yeah, and a lot of lot of good podcasts. Yeah, to listen to a lot of people talking about things and maybe just grab or one two ideas set into my context and say, okay, let's let's try to do that. Oh, that's awesome. It's great to hear the sort of timeline of your career and the different people. And obviously, I know there will be a lot, but it, and it's hard to narrow it down sometimes, isn't there? But some good names there. And we've had Mike Boyle on the podcast as well. And I think that was, uh, <laughs> it was an interesting, it's always an interesting chat with Mike, isn't it? And hearing what he've, he's got to say. Yeah, this is, uh, he, is, he has always, he has so much experience um, in, in, uh, in, in the real world and uh, it's always worth to listen to him and uh, it gives it's, it, at the end if you listen carefully to him it gives you a shortcut <laughs> yeah. so um, you're not allowed to that that's another advice so I was allowed that the 2007 jumping in uh, the, 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 the the field was open I was I was allowed to make mistakes I was wasn't to, to, to allowed to do it today um, so I learned a lot of it, but uh, if you jump into a position like this, in these times, you're not allowed to do th those mistakes. So you better listen carefully to those people who work in, in, that, uh, in that positions and uh, don't yeah, be calm and <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> watch no, out. I think that's top advice. And I think there's some been, been some great information in the episode, Andrea. So I really appreciate you, you coming on and doing it. If anyone wants to sort of reach out, if they've got questions or they wanted to just build a network and reach out to you, is there anywhere they can do that? Uh, I think the best is uh, on LinkedIn. I think this is uh, this is my my professional social network uh, at the end. Um, so um, if you have any 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 training related questions or or uh, content related questions, I'll, I'll be there. Maybe I'm I'm not answering right away, but uh, I will answer. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. And I appreciate your time today. Um, I know it's a busy period, especially like you say, we're working with the players in small groups at the moment. It's probably as busy a period as ever for you. So I really appreciate you giving up some time and coming on to the podcast. And um, when the season does get going and we have a bit a better idea of when the games are, I wish you all the best for the rest of the season. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye.